There have been many occasions here upon our channel where we have explored artifacts and evidential ruins indicative of a tremendous prehistoric age. Testimonies, photography, even physical proofs, locations of some finds making their ages undeniably enormous. This, along with the sheer amount of said evidence collected and exposed over the years, making their authenticity and indeed the evidence to suggest the existence of a now lost yet once incredibly ancient civilization overwhelming. With our next expose of ancient finds of no exception, although the following could have been aiding in the expansion of mankind's knowledge of its origins, it has instead been quietly ignored by those in favor of doubling down on a funded paradigm, one seemingly crumbling around them. Greece, a thorn in the side of many an academic for centuries, with unexplainable architecture and finds that simply lack explanation. There exists, however, a far deeper reason for this persisting annoyance the competing recordings of finds made far before any funded paradigm had arisen, by people in positions of specialist authorities, documentation of remains of human inhabitation supporting our many videos' subject matters. These finds dated within the Pliocene era of at least some 2-5 to five million years ago. As mentioned in The Forbidden Archaeologist by Michael Cremo, quote, Today, scientists say that the oldest evidence for human presence in Greece can be found at the Petrolona site, where human bones and artifacts, attributed to our archaic Homo sapiens, go back to between 200,000 and 500,000 years ago. But taking the role of the Egyptian priest, I might say to these modern Solons that the history of a human presence in Greece goes much further back than they might imagine. The Greek scientist who reported the Petrolona discovery, A. N. Polianos, announced further discoveries far more ancient than Petrolona Man. The Anthropology Museum of Petacus gave the following information. In 1977, Isaac Pandelidis, the owner of a sand pit not far from the village of Perticus, chanced upon the remains of a large animal. He informed the Greek Anthropological Society, and the excavations were directed by the anthropologist Eris Polianos, who brought to light the skeleton of a mammoth, approximately 3 million years old. Though the entire skeleton was found, the bones were in disarray and had evidently been killed, butchered, and consumed by humans." End quote. This timeline flies in the face of modern evolutionary chronology and, if accepted as it should, coming from legitimate sources who documented said finds correctly, the timeline of man should rightly be pushed back to an unknown origin, and we strongly feel more effort should be put into this investigative direction. The mammoth, along with Cremo's effortless correlation of the facts, is a gem of proof and a continued glimmer of hope that if such finds continue to surface, modern paradigms will slowly shift to a more critically established realization of not only our history, but of our existence itself. It was a find, and indeed is a journey, which we find highly compelling. There are many enigmatic, unexplained ancient mysteries which we have covered here on our channel. Many mysterious ruins which are slowly revealing their secrets to us. However, what must be the most intriguing of the historical subcategories has to be the O-parts, out-of-place artifacts that have been found all over Earth. These mystifying items are the only subject within the field which can shed their own very unique lights upon the distant past and sometimes hard-to-believe possibilities attached to their ages. The island of Samos within Greece is home to a number of these particular artifacts. 1.5 kilometers off the coast of Turkey, this small island has a big history. Within the island's capital museum is a wide range of very impressive artifacts. The most interesting among the collection is undoubtedly the strange bronze artifact which according to academia, merely depicts a strange form of unknown carriage that would have once been pulled by horses. However, some also believe that the strange animals are actually depicting a form of periscope, and that the entire artifact is actually that of an ancient submarine. Additionally, there also exists another amazing artifact that we felt was worth a mention, found within private collection. Originally a religious idol, what do you think this wooden artifact is depicting? 
Could it actually be that of modern day paragliders? Somehow sent back in time, seen and depicted by this once ancient people as a religious vision? It's an incredible, if rather imaginative thought, but it is testament to such artifacts intriguing nature. There are many incredible, out of place artifacts that can be found all over Earth. Each one just waiting to spark our interest. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. There are countless ancient uparts, which can be found littering ancient antiquities, and indeed, the exhibits, which are so often attributed to an ancient civilization, subsequently debunked by said studies as having been capable of such ancient developments. As such, these artifacts are known as out-of-place artifacts or uparts, as they have become affectionately known. One such artifact is that of the Wedge of Ayud, a large, clearly machined piece of metal made of high-purity aluminium, dated by many researchers as that of an ancient artifact. The problem is, aluminium in this density was not developed by modern man until the late 19th century, around 1825 to be precise. Weighing an impressive 5 pounds in weight, the wedge was originally dug up, found deep within the sediments of a riverbank in modern-day Romania, disregarded by many as that of a modern-day JCB tooth. There are just as many, however, who argue, and we feel for good reason as we shall reveal, that this artifact is indeed ancient and has, through the years, continued to raise difficult questions to answer. Ancient alien enthusiasts insist that the wedge is a segment of an ancient alien craft, or more specifically, a VTOL type craft, better known as a vertical takeoff and landing craft, and the large visible signs of aging are supportive of not only a tremendous age, but of its currently unexplainable origins here on Earth. It was found during digging on a construction project, along with two mastodon bones in 35 feet of sand. Someone gave it to the Museum of History of Transylvania, where it lay ignored in a storeroom for 20 years, before editors from a Romanian UFO magazine found it in 1995. Furthermore, Although some skeptics attempt to argue that the wedge is of modern origins, it was found in the same layer as that of the mastodon bones, with the wedge accepted by a large number of others as being at least 11,000 years old. This dating makes this a very peculiar item indeed, and something which we feel demands further examination. If the wedge is indeed around 11,000 years old, as the evidence, witness testimony, and dating of the sediments it was found within would suggest, then the question of how such a lump of almost pure, clearly machined aluminium originated from, and indeed what was the original purpose of the wedge? Was it like the ancient alien enthusiasts insist once part of a vertical takeoff and landing craft? or maybe from something else. Questions still circle the wedge's true origins, and without solid evidence to prove the wedge's modern origins, we must stick to the evidence already acquired, that of the wedge's original resting place, the dating of said sediments, and the lack of any contradictory evidence in regards to works being done in this area at this depth along the riverbank within Romania. We must entertain the idea that this five-pound, almost pure metallic object is indeed that of an ancient upart, and any other explanation lacking evidence is just an attempt to disregard such claims as they do not jive with modern paradigm, an occurrence we witness all too often. What is the Wedge of Ayud? How old is it? Could it indeed be 11,000 years old? And if so, how was it manufactured and machined, and what could it have been possibly used for? It is an object which we find highly compelling. The Ulfberts A group of medieval swords found within Europe, dating between the 9th and 11th centuries. The blade faces are inlaid with the inscription Ulfbert, with a cross on either side. The word turns out to have been a Frankish personal name. It somehow has become the basis logo 
a trademark of sorts used by multiple bladesmiths for several centuries in their impressive attempts to make the hardest, most impressive swords of the era. About 100 to 170 Ulfbert swords are known to exist, yet the origins of the name remain somewhat of an enigma. However, we dare to postulate that the name may have originated with, with this sword in particular. A sword which these bladesmiths may have been attempting to replicate and indeed figure out how it was made. A Nova National Geographic documentary titled Secrets of the Viking Sword, which first aired in 2012, actually took a look at this enigmatic sword's metallurgical composition. The Ulfbert sword has almost no slag content within its composition, and it has a carbon content three times that of other metals of the time. Carbon found to be a great addition in strengthening steel, creating a metal known as crucible steel. A critical discovery, something which made England famous some 800 years after this sword's creation. In the process of forging iron, the ore must be heated to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. This will bring the metal to a liquid molten state, allowing blacksmiths to reduce impurities called slag. However, medieval technology did not allow iron to be heated to such a high temperature. Thus, the slag was removed by pounding it out, a far less effective method. Modern blacksmith Richard Furrer of Wisconsin spoke to Nova about the difficulties of making such a sword. Furrer is described in the documentary as one of the few people on the planet who has the skills needed to try to reproduce the Ulfbert by hand. To do it right, it is the most complicated thing I know how to make, he said. He commented on how the Ulfbert maker would have been regarded as possessing magical powers. To be able to make a weapon from dirt is a pretty powerful thing, he said. But to make a weapon at this time within history that could bend such without breaking, stay so sharp, and weigh so little, would be regarded as supernatural. Furrer spent days of continuous, painstaking work forging a similar sword. He used medieval technology, although it required highly unconventional ways never before suspected or documented. The tiniest flaw or mistake, turning the sword into a piece of scrap metal. He declared his success at the end as more relief than joy. Who was the maker of this sword? How did they know how to make it? The mystery surrounding this out-of-place artifact persists to this day. Beit Sherim is an ancient cemetery located within Galilee. Very close by is a natural cave. It had apparently fallen into disuse at the end of the 4th century and filled up partially with 4 or 5 feet of clay-like silt. In 1956, a bulldozer was taken in to clear the rubble, but what it would uncover can be seen as an enormous upart, an out-of-place artifact. It turned out to be a large ancient rectangular slab made from an unknown material. Because of its size, measuring 6.5 by 11 feet long, 18 inches thick and weighing in at over 9 tons, it was not surprisingly left where it lay. With a perfectly level surface, its origins were a mystery, yet alas, at the time, not a pressing one. However, in 1963, members of a joint expedition of the Corning Museum of Glass and the University of Missouri would bring to light a curious reality. While surveying the region for possible remains of ancient glass factories, someone suggested that the Bet Sharim slab might have been made of glass. A suggestion initially perceived as a joke. Amazingly, chemical analysis was indeed carried out, confirming that this enormous and extremely ancient slab was indeed made of glass. It is therefore believed that the Bet Sharim slab is a huge piece of first stage glass meant to have been broken up and fashioned into objects somewhere else that for some reason was abandoned right where it was made. In conclusion, several factors surrounding the existence of the slab are currently unexplainable. According to mainstream views surrounding the evolution of glassmaking, the production of such an enormous base material would have been simply impossible, requiring over 12 tons of raw materials over 20 tons of furnace fuel, the maintaining of a temperature of over 1100 degrees centigrade for no less than five continuous days, finally producing a nine-ton slab of perfectly level, perfectly rectangular glass, 
clearly demonstrates the requirement of a highly advanced refinery with highly advanced technologies harnessed by a past civilization. Additionally, at the time of its discovery, only two other pieces of glass have ever been created that are larger. Both rest within the enormous telescopic mirrors of machines developed within the past century. It seems clear to us that the Beth Shireen slab is one of those rare gems that clearly demonstrates the past existence of a highly advanced, highly capable ancient civilization that once lived and was unfortunately lost here on Earth. We have in the past covered the astonishing ancient high technology still present within the gas-filled lens of Nineveh, along with this proof of an ancient civilization's knowledge of glass blowing and convex lens making. There is seemingly many more examples that have quietly been found, studied, and pushed into the archives of museums worldwide. In particular, those found within the ancient sites upon Crete. Although many a sleuth has discovered this fact and have subsequently investigated these claims and indeed proofs of an ancient civilization's astute awareness and past ability at creating these perplexing reading lenses lenses of a surprisingly high quality. The first exposure of this truth came from a most unlikely of sources, that being the July issue of the British Journal of Physiological Optics in 1930, which contained a communication from a Mr. H. L. Taylor in, quote, The Origin and Development of Lenses in Ancient Times, which ascribes the development of the lenses to the Cretans of 1800 BC. His examination of the museums of the Eastern Mediterranean has led him to the conclusion that ivory and steatite, the materials used for beads prior to 2000 BC, later replaced with rock crystals, onyx, agate, and cornelian. The discovery of the magnification produced by a bead of rock crystal, he believes, led to the production of lens-shaped beads and eventually of lenses such as those of the Royal Gaming Board found in the palace at Knossos, the best of which now rest within the archives of the museum Candia within Crete. Their magnification ability has been recorded at between 5 and 8 diopters and are plano convex in shape. These quality lenses were then transported out of the area to the mainland, including Troy, Tyre, Nineveh, and the United Kingdom." End quote. However, any explanation as to how these ancient artifacts were indeed created remains unknown, or indeed untold. The closest anyone dare tread is claiming they are of natural rock crystal origins and developed accidentally. Regardless, their existence is undeniably highly compelling. The toppled obelisk of Axum within Ethiopia is not only one of the largest ancient megaliths on our planet, but indeed a rare surviving wonder of the ancient world. Estimated at well over 1,000 tons, it was mysteriously toppled sometime in history, destroyed like so many other enormous relics of a lost antiquity, possibly during a cataclysmic event, and its resulting earthquakes. Yet, regardless, this gigantic ancient monument was once quarried transported, and then somehow erected at the foot of where it now lay. Among the many other smaller obelisks, all curiously still standing monuments. The site is in addition to the megalith, covered in false windows. Now we feel a feature which can be used as overwhelming proof that the builders of said site were not only in contact intercontinental, but in cooperation in regard to construction and stone-cutting technologies. Not only do the tunnel systems, claimed as tombs within the Axum site, possess polygonal masonry, an additional, now lost technology, yet also found intercontinentally within ancient sites around the globe. Furthermore, however, we can add another chapter to this proof of a once existing, now lost, but once highly capable and thus highly advanced ancient worldwide civilization, having once been responsible for the 1,000 plus ton megalithic sites around the world. Metal Clamps
Another subject we have covered comprehensively, linking to many sites, which according to modern paradigm were geographically impossible to have been in contact, even during the dates they themselves pin on them. These metal clamp seats were initially cut into the huge stones at strategic positions. Then, molten metal, often enigmatic and advanced in metallurgy, were poured into these cuts to pin the stones together, preventing them from slipping over time, retaining their perfect alignment. How can we continue to believe that the evidence for our argument be ignored, dismissed as conspiracy, the hypothesis refused serious investigation. We find this highly compelling. Ancient Uparts A section of ancient history which many find as their preference, it is undeniably one of the strongest areas of argument within the study of antiquities, which is in support of the past existence of once highly capable, incredibly technologically advanced, yet now lost ancient civilizations. The ancient astronaut theory being one main topic of interest within the Uparts realm. When it comes to certain current or now past allies, in alliance with our so often reiterated posit of the existence and the volumes of surviving evidence in support of a now lost, often also claimed, now actively hidden, enormous number of chapters of human history. It is thanks to their laborious collaborative efforts which has allowed us to accomplish such a strong and compelling evidence. In addition, the realization that much of these sites and anomalous features also display a strong evidential suggestion that many of these civilizations somehow succumbed suddenly, possibly to a past cataclysm. However, if this vast and still growing file of evidence, all suggesting sudden demise, is, in the future, somehow found to have been an undeniable reality, possibly a repeated event. A question arises. Who could these claimed ancient astronauts possibly have been? The evidence suggesting sudden halts in undertaking within countless elaborately created by clearly highly resourced people, megalithic quarries, which were inexplicably abandoned, litter our planet. This may suggest that these uparts are either of returning, unfortunate witnesses to this cataclysm, somehow returning many generations later, successfully making contact with a civilization raised from the ashes of their now forgotten world. Somehow surviving all this time in an ancient spacecraft, possibly better, possibly similar to our own modern space stations, absent long enough to be depicted by a people presumably astonished by their existence. Secondly, they could quite possibly depict ancient alien visitors to our planet, either once deliberately making contact or once crashing here, forcing these entities to make contact, thus witnessed. Yet, if true, their likeness to Earthlings is a controversial consequence to said history. Or are all somehow a mere coincidence? One or two hoaxes, we feel, is a real reality. But for all these magnificent, enigmatic, and often clear depictions of similarly-looking individuals, all being hoaxes? Yet so far separated geographically, we find unlikely. One must keep this in mind when studying such artifacts, such as the Istanbul rocket. The claimed ancient space module, which became one of the most popular artifacts of the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. Sought after by Western scientists and media alike, poured over and written about in hundreds of articles across Europe. Even featuring on television programs and within many newspaper articles. However, what is fascinating about this reality, that for many years, many specialists, often talented people, also just as often funded to presumably determine an inaccuracy in the object's claimed age, did not. Not until a few years ago, that is. In the last few years, it has been that the Istanbul rocket was apparently found to have been a hoax. A plaster cast made some 25 years ago. A puzzling claim when one remembers that just five years after, the space module was sought after by German and English among many other national archaeologists, and was, for a long time, secured in the preservation unit of the museum. 
Was this really a plaster cast, a mere five years old when this discovery was announced, successfully fooling the world's scientific communities? Or was it like so many other artifacts we study, successfully stolen, then replaced with a clear fake? We will leave that up to you to decide from the evidence available. But an argument for found crash craft can also be seen in the inspiration for the creation of things, like that of the lid of Pakal's tomb. An enigmatic depiction of this same form of technology, again, turns up all over South America, and even further afield. The Kiev Spaceman, yet another found far away in the remote, desolate landscapes of Ukraine. Clearly, a depiction of a gas-breathing humanoid-shaped being, depicted with seemingly no injuries, Yet the reason for said depiction is an ongoing debate, yet due to its clear characteristics, a welcome member of this long list of ancient Uparts. Ancient astronauts? Or merely an extremely elaborate, highly complex, hard-worked, long-lived hoax? We find the evidence to support the theory highly compelling. The Crystal Skulls, a set of the world's most alluring artifacts possessing the power to create religions, snaring many a Hollywood figure with their mysticism and rumored possible alien origins. Firstly, how does one tell a real crystal skull from a fake? There are always artists capable of making and selling things that seem old, says anthropologist Jane McLaren Walsh of the Smithsonian Museum. And she should know, Walsh has seen her share of fakes. In fact, she's probably seen more crystal skulls than anyone else alive, subsequently becoming the leading academic on the subject. A stern skeptic with a ruthless ethic, only the most puzzling will convince Jane. Another major player in the skull game, according to Walsh, was Frederick Arthur Mitchell Hedges, an English stockbroker turned adventurer, who in 1943 began displaying a skull at dinner parties which he called the Skull of Doom. His daughter Anna later claimed that he had found the skull in a ruined temple in Belize during the early 1920s. However, this was later found to have been a lie. Investigations by the Linnean Society of London, a research institute specializing in taxonomy and natural history, revealed that Mitchell Hedges actually purchased his skull at auction at Sotheby's in London in 1943. How it came to be at the auction house, however, was never established. Which is unfortunate, because the Mitchell Hedges skull, according to Walsh's scrupulous examination, is the only one she has ever had to reluctantly confirm as an authentic crystal skull. What's more, it is the only academically accepted original known within the public archives. Smaller than other examples, which under microscope analysis were seen to have been made using rotary drills, the Mitchell Hedges skull is a more finely crafted, yet more crudely designed example that under the atomic microscope has shown signs of having indeed been an ancient pre-Columbian artifact, which sure enough was constructed using, quote, unknown technology. There are of course many examples of crystal skulls around the world, and many more stories surrounding their mysterious construction. Elongated examples, stories of groups of these skulls initiating some form of energy field, Ancient laser cutting technology has also been claimed time and time again. However, we felt we would approach them from another angle to experience the rare occasion when modern, specifically funded academic institutes buckle to overwhelming evidence, proofs given by the defeated skeptic to those who pursue nothing but the perplexing truth and a direction for study. Made from a single piece of quartz crystal, Mitchell's Skull of Doom is unquestionably an exquisite example of an unknown history here upon our planet. Regardless of beliefs, or indeed the superstitions which now surround them, there are a rare few which support the theory of lost civilization and ancient visitation. This skull is much smaller than many and crudely carved, leading museum scholars here to believe that in a world of fakes, this one is the real thing. Uparts, the an acronym for out-of-place artifacts, objects often found in extraordinary places, inexplicable in nature, and repeatedly dismissed by any who conform to mainstream institutional timelines for Homo sapiens. According to these, 
apparently already laid out chronologies specifically for man, the immense age of some of the out-of-place artifacts make their existences simply impossible to explain. The Nampa doll, for example, a favorite upart of a number of antiquarians and alternative historians alike. Found deep within the Earth's sediment, pumped to the surface, amongst the sediment which had been resting there for at least two million years, this small clay figurine, even adorned with surviving details of the fashion at the time of its creation. And although fascinating, this video does not focus upon zinc vases dynamited out of stone quarries, or iron pots found in 500 million year old coal seams, or even the imprints of chariot wheels found deep in mines in Russia. It pertains to a modest artifact, a simple mortar and pestle once found by a J.H. Neal. And although today mortar and pestles are not the most interesting of utensils, it is their extreme ages which make them remarkable finds. Confirmed as being of immense age, this mortar and pestle was found left in situ, discovered by a Mr. J. H. Neal in tertiary deposits dating back almost 33 to 55 million years. And just like that of the iron pot, found in the foundry, dated at 500 million years, felt compelled to create their own personal affidavits regarding the events and the legitimacy therein, no matter how hard it was to explain. These men felt compelled to do all they could to prove the legitimacy of said discoveries. On August 2, 1890, J. H. Neal signed an affidavit swearing his discovery to have been 100% legitimate. Mr. Neal declared that it is utterly impossible that these relics could have reached the position in which they once lay, unless it was at the time the gravel was deposited and present, yet before the lava cap formed giving a dating of around 33 million years old. How old is our species? Where do our origins lay? Within this vast, ancient, and seemingly infinite universe, have we, as Earthlings, experienced ancient cataclysm? An amnesic event as so many ancient texts write of? If yes, then to what level of sophistication did these now lost ancient ancestors once reach? sophistications far too advanced for any mainstream publication to ever publish. It is a reality that the continual discovery of such artifacts are slowly proving was indeed a reality, no matter how difficult it is for any institute or individual historian to accept as a reality. It is an upart which we find highly compelling. Dorchester, Massachusetts, USA, in 1852, at Meeting House Quarry, workers were using dynamite to break up the bedrock, when an explosion threw an artifact into the light of day, after spending many thousands of years under the earth. According to geologists, the Roxbury Rock, in which this mysterious artifact was embedded, has been dated as having accumulated between 570 and 593 million years ago, during the Eddie Cannon period. Imagine their surprise, when workers spotted a metallic object amongst the debris of the explosion, still partially embedded in a chunk of rock, and now sheared into two pieces from the forces of the blast. A zinc vase covered in flower decorations painted in solid silver. The bell-shaped pot is around four and a half inches tall and about six and a half inches long, and was noted as being exquisitely made. The age of the vase has been heavily debated amongst specialists, with many struggling to produce ages smaller than 100,000 years. Additionally, the species of flowers and plants that are illustrated upon the vase also went extinct over 100,000 years ago. Not surprisingly, but rather predictably, the pot along with all authenticated documentation regarding its discovery, mysteriously vanished without trace shortly before a full investigation into its amazing history could take place. The initial discovery was covered on June 5, 1852, from the publication of the magazine Scientific American, which confirms its authenticity as indeed being found embedded in the solid ancient stone, 15 feet below the surface. But shortly after this coverage, like so many other amazing objects found around the world vanished without trace. Who made this amazing artifact, when was it made? If we go by the age of the rock in which it was discovered, it is amazingly over 500 million years old, but we may never know. 
In 1944, a 10-year-old boy by the name of Newton Anderson was playing in his basement, smashing lumps of coal with a mallet, when he made an amazing discovery. The coal that he was playing with had been mined very near to where he lived in Upshur County, West Virginia, and is largely accepted to be around 300 million years old. Imagine then, Newton's, and subsequently his parents' surprise, when he presented to them this small bell, complete with strange winged figure and its possibly very ancient clapper, later found to be made of iron. Although there are many people who now insist that the dating of the coal must be incorrect, this little bell could also be a long-lost relic, lost within woodland, that over the eons becomes perfectly preserved within the eventual coal seam, lost by an advanced civilization which once inhabited Earth. The bell is considered an antediluvian artifact or an object of pre-flood origins by the Institute for Creation Research, who had the bell submitted for laboratory testing at the University of Oklahoma. Whilst there, a nuclear activation analysis revealed that the bell contained an unusual mix of metals, a mix of metals not uncommon to Earth but rather unusual for our current civilization to have decided to have manufactured it with, further supporting its authenticity as a very ancient relic. Later on in his life, Newton Anderson spent a great deal of time researching the figure atop the bell. He discovered similarities to the Babylonian southwest wind demon called Pazuzu. The demon typically is shown with a prominent headpiece like the bell figure. The Hindu deity, Garuda, is sometimes depicted on top of bells, as is the Egyptian Isis. The kneeling posture with hands clasped is also quite like Garuda representations, and because of this, some have argued that it must be an Indian Ganta bell. However, these similar and often confusing arguments over very similar deities could be seen as a consequence of cataclysm. Past civilization and the mythologies briefly retained, and all recorded at a time before such belief systems became too clouded with other outside influences. Another rare artifact is this strange handle, also found in coal and fortunately photographed before it vanished forever. Totally petrified and reportedly appeared to have virtually turned to coal. According to those who briefly investigated it, the handle appeared as well made as any modern handle. What do you think regarding these strange objects? Can coal form and objects petrify faster than we have ever witnessed? Or are these relics indeed millions of years old? Thanks for watching guys and until next time, take care. Hey guys, so today I wanted to share with you a rather special out of place artifact. It's known as the Fisher Canyon footprint and it's actually a lump of coal. However, this small lump of coal is something very special. It's an artifact we hold dear to our hearts here at Mystery History. Since its discovery in the early 1900s by a man named John T. Reed, a character we have actually covered in the past, it has been silencing skeptics and evolutionists the world over. John T. Reed was the man responsible for confirming native Indian legends of a race of red-headed giants that once terrorized the American continent some 13,000 years ago. When John found the Fisher Canyon footprint, he reported it to the New York Sunday American. The coal layer in which the fossil was found was dated at over 15 million years ago. Microscopic photography that was carried out by the Rockefeller Institute, presumably attempting to discredit the find, actually confirmed that it was indeed a heel print of a hand-stitched shoe, and that the fossil seemed to show the presence of two rows of stitches along the edge of the sole, with twists of thread clearly visible in the photography. The right side of the shoe also appeared more worn than the left, indicating that it was worn on the right foot. Crystals of mercury sulfide, collected during the analysis, only confirmed the fossilized shoe print's enormous age. After the test results were in, Samuel Hubbard of the Museum of Archaeology in Oakland, California, buckled to the sheer amount of conclusive evidence by telling the press, quote, Today's people are not yet able to make this kind of shoe. Facing this kind of evidence indicates that at the time of suspected uncivilized arthropods, Millions of years ago, people with high intelligence appear to have existed. Detail of the threads proves that it was the sole of a shoe and was strictly the handiwork of man." End quote. This is why we love the Fisher Canyon footprint so much. It sat in the back of museum collections for years, silently waiting for evolutionists and skeptics alike to stumble upon its existence, only for it to then cast its spell of tremendous doubt upon their way of thinking. They can produce no real explanation for it 
The best any mainstream scientist or anthropologist can do is ignore the evidence and conclude it's just a natural formation. Unfortunately, the footprint conveniently went missing a few years ago, even though by all accounts it was just a lump of coal. The story has also been hijacked over the years, with the Rockefeller Institute's test results subsequently vanishing. However, luckily for us, the quotes by Hubbard are in press archives all over the world. This small lump of coal is sure to fuel the argument for years to come.